say thank you to everyone who's watching who are giving up, you know, a little bit of your um, super busy schedules right now to come listen to us talk about um, nerdy hockey stuff. This was a really great excuse to like put on makeup for the first time in like a month. Um, not enough to put on like real pants, but you know, it's not, we're not that fancy. So um, just a little bit about me. Uh, confusingly, yes, my name is also Megan. Um, I work with data pretty much all day in my day job. I work in higher ed as a data manager and also spend a fair amount of time um, also as a hockey analyst. Um, I write for Hockey Graphs, which you should definitely check out if you haven't, if you are at all interested in any kind of these nerdy hockey things. Um, and I'm also an R enthusiast and really enjoy learning about R and helping other people learn about R. Um, this talk today is not about R specifically. It's really more just about kind of getting the courage and the confidence to start your analysis um, work and move beyond Excel. And I mean, I use R, so my examples are going to be in R, but most of the principles and the things I'm going to talk about aren't really specific to any kind of language. So, I mean, if you want, you can just pretend every time I say R, I'm actually saying Python. If that's what you want to learn, uh, that's totally fine. So I'm assuming that all of you are, a, you know, rich, varied tapestry of people, um, but this is kind of the specific person that I designed this talk for. It is someone that has started to work with kind of manipulating and visualizing and analyzing data. Um, I'm probably assuming that that data is hockey related considering if you, you know, found us, but it doesn't have to be any kind of data. Of course, my examples are going to be hockey data because all of my coding examples are with hockey data because that's how I learned and how I find the most fun. Um, I'm assuming that you probably use Excel. That's how, you know, most people get started when they're working with data, if you're new to working with data. And that you're probably either curious about learning to code or you're already on your way to learning to code and just kind of need some continual motivation along the way. So the first rule, which is really important of this talk, is this talk is about moving on from Excel, but I'm not here to like shame people for using Excel because Excel is a very popular, very useful program that is very good at the things that it is designed to do. But I find that too many people kind of start to use Excel, kind of kind of push the boundaries of Excel and start to use Excel in like a less efficient way. And I know that because that was me, like when I started working with hockey data, I was working in Excel. And I personally stayed in Excel too long because I assumed that I could never learn to code. That was for I don't know, people who learn to code, which doesn't make sense. People know, who know how to code. But, um, and I really don't want, I want to help as many people avoid that pitfall as I can. Because if I, I mean, if I learn to code, like you can learn to code, like I swear. So, but I'm not shaming anyone for using Excel. Like Excel is a great program. I just want to be able to help people over the hump if that's where they want to go. Okay, so the goals for this little talk tonight is we're going to talk about I know I said I'm not going to shame Excel, which I'm not, but we're going to talk about some of the limitations of Excel when you want your analysis to be efficient and reproducible and shareable. And again, we're going to talk about the advantages of R or like whatever language you want. Again, just pretend I'm saying Python. That's fine. Um, and hopefully at the end of this talk, if you are one of those people that you know is hoping to learn how to code, this kind of gives you the motivation and kind of a roadmap to going forward. So we're going to use, I'm going to do a little bit of a data example with data from Money Puck, which is a great site that has a lot of hockey data if you aren't familiar with it. Um, I've included this little, I'm going to post my slides afterwards so you can see these, but if anyone wants to get this data and then they can kind of follow along with what I did in the slides, all you have to do on Money Puck is go up to download data and then we are looking at the skater data set from this current season or this past season. I'm, I don't really know what to call it, but from 2019, 20. And if you open that data in Excel, uh, this is what it looks like. And you can see that it is aggregated data by player and by, situ by game situation, by game strength state. So we basically have a row for each player, for each game, for each strength state. And this particular data set has a lot more variables. Um, it keeps going quite a ways to the right in Excel, but we're only for this purpose, we're only going to look at a few. So they're all in this little screenshot. So if you were just looking at this data, um, these are a couple of hypothetical questions that you might have that we could answer here. 
First is that among forwards on the power play, who play frequently on the power play, we made an arbitrary cutoff here of 100 shifts, which forwards have the longest average shifts in seconds? And then the other question we have is, if you're looking at five on five, which position players, like forwards or defensemen, who has higher average shifts per game? Now, these questions are pretty easy to answer in Excel. For our longest average shifts question, all we really have to do is create a shift length variable. It's easy enough to do in Excel, ice, ice time divided by shifts, and then do some filters. We only want forwards. Um, we only want five on four strength states, and we only want players that have played at least 100 shifts at five on four, just so we are kind of getting rid of some of our outliers. And we want to sort this descending by shift length so we can see these top players. And this is just a screenshot of Excel that I did those, you know, four or five things, and this is what it looks like. Ovechkin is number one, McDavid is number two. This like matches what, you know, your eye test would tell you. These are the players that play a long time on the power play. Very easy. And the same is true for our second kind of question here. When we're looking at the most shifts per game, all we have to do again is create a shifts per game variable. And you probably noticed that the original money puck data splits out position by centers and wingers. And so we would just kind of want to create a grouped variable to group all those players together as forwards. We want to get down to five on five, filter our games played, and then find the average values. And of course you could do this also with a pivot table, but as you well know, we can just, you know, this one right here looks at forwards. And if you highlight this shift per game column, Excel will helpfully show you the average, which is like just under 16. So again, very easy. But you can really quickly run into some roadblocks here. So what if somebody asks you exactly what you did? If somebody asks me that, because I did just do this, um, it would be pretty easy for me to answer because I just did this this week. And this is a fairly innocuous question. But if someone asks me in like three months, maybe, because I posted something on Twitter and someone had a question about it, I might not remember, especially if um, you're probably familiar with this. If you're trying to answer, if you're working with an Excel file and trying to answer multiple questions like we were there, um, it can kind of get confusing because you're filtering this, you're filtering here for this question and there for that question. And you just kind of get lost. And it's really easy to forget like, oh, did I, was I filtering on like how many shifts, you know, was my cutoff? It's, it's just really easy to kind of forget those sorts of things. And also, what if we get refresh data? Again, what if this, what if the 2019-20 season does miraculously continue and then Money Puck would produce a new Excel file? And if you were interested in kind of getting an updated version of the answers to these questions, you would have to download the data and do all of those things in Excel all over again, which would be annoying. And hopefully you would remember exactly what you did. <clears throat> and same, if you... Um, if there's something that you want to make note of, again, this kind of ties back into the first point. And this particular data set is fairly simple, but the example that I was thinking of for this was, you know, earlier this season, the Blues um, had a game that was canceled after Jay Bomeister had his incident. And maybe if you were working with game data and the questions you were trying to answer is you always wanted to remove that game from your analysis. Again, just once, that's really easy to do. But if you keep working with data, it would be difficult to remember every single time that you have to delete that one Blues game. And that's something that would be kind of difficult to notate in Excel. And um, I think next week in this, um, for Hannah, uh, Allison is talking about data tracking. And we heard a lot about data tracking just in the coaches panel. Like there's a lot of people that do data tracking. And let's say, again, you were working with this money puck data, but you also had all of this tracking data that you had done yourself and you wanted to join that in, add that into the money puck data so you could kind of analyze it together. And yes, I'm aware that VLOOKUPs exist in Excel, but it's kind of a pain to do. And again, not super intuitive. And there are just a lot easier ways to do that if you're joining in lots of different data. And lastly, our last kind of little what if scenario here is what if you have to make a graph? And it is possible, again, I'm not Excel shaming, it is possible to make a good looking graph in Excel, but it is not easy and um, it's not very reproducible because again, you're doing these things with pointing and clicking and that just makes it much harder to reproduce the graph that you made. So let's try this in R. 
Um, we're just going to answer these exact two same questions that we used in Excel, but we're going to show how it would look if we did them in R instead. So here, again, for our longest average shifts, this is the exact same thing, the exact same steps that we did in Excel. You're just writing them down and using different verbs. So here, um, in R, creating a new variable, you use the mutate function. So again, we're creating a shift length variable. We're doing, these are the exact same filter conditions that we had before, and we're sorting. And then it looks like this, which if you go back to the screenshot from Excel, these are the same players, Ovechkin, McDavid, Dreisaitl. Um, much easier. And the exact same is true if we want to answer our other question is for which forwards or defenseman who has more average shifts per game. Again, we're using the mutate function. We're creating two new variables, shifts per game, and you know this position grouped function with an if statement here. We're filtering. And the way to kind of make a pivot table, quote unquote, in R, is just the combination of the group function and the summarize function. And then you get this. So as everyone knows, uh, defensemen tend to take more shifts per game than forwards do. And so what if here, again, what if someone asked exactly what you did? Well, this is the same code that I showed before. It's just had comments added to it because I think one thing that is very important for people who are new to coding is it is impossible to overemphasize the importance of commenting your code. Um, the main kind of idea around that is you should comment your code as if other people will read it and other people includes you in the future when you have like forgotten everything that you have ever done. And it's also really useful for noting like here, this is the skaters file that I downloaded from Money Puck on this particular day. And again, this was a, these examples are, are quite simple, but you can get complex and you will make choices and you will not remember why you made those choices. And so it just makes it much easier to have a record of what you've done and you can include justification for why you made all of these decisions. So again, in our hypothetical hopeful scenario that this season resumes, Money Puck might release a new data set and then you want to refresh your data so that you have you know, more up-to-date answers to these questions. And all you have to do, again, this first line of code up here, that just brings in the data. So you just download another Money Puck file and you can bring it in and then run the code. Much easier than having to point and click and redo everything in Excel and hope, you know, hope that you remember everything that you did. So again, here, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, if there's something that you wanted to make note of. The example I used before of, um, the example I used before of wanting to remove a certain game is a better example than what I have here. Again, this, this data is uh, fairly small, fairly simple, but it is possible, like let's say if you know you really hate the Leafs and you want to get rid of the Leafs in every single data set that you work with and just ignore them completely. That would be maybe difficult to remember every single time you work with data, or I guess that would depend on like how much you hated the Leafs. Maybe it's like always at the front of your brain, so it's easy enough to remember to do that every time. But you could really easily create a function like I have here that would just that you could apply to all of your data and just remove the Leafs. Um, so you don't have to remember to do that every time. But again, more realistically, you could do this for that scenario we talked about, about removing um, that Blues game. You would just have to know the game ID for that if you're working with game data, and you could have that you know, in all of your scripts so that you always remove that game. Or the, you know, the real reason people use functions, any tasks that you do frequently. Um, if you find yourself writing code, or again, if you find yourself always filtering the same things in Excel, it's really useful to just write a function in R, and then it can do it for you. And you can also, R is really useful for creating tests to check for mistakes. Again, this particular data set is fairly small, um, but again, it's easy. Like you can imagine sometimes when you're working in Excel, you accidentally delete things. And it's just really easy in R to write tests in order to check for these kinds of mistakes. Like I often work with um, NHL play-by-play -play data. And just recently, just a few weeks ago, I ended up scraping one day's worth of games twice. So for about 10 different games, I had everything duplicated. And it was only because I had some tests in my code that check for things like that, that I was able to catch it. Otherwise, you know, my data would be wrong and that would be a really difficult thing. Like I would never just notice that on my own. So being able to have these automated checks is super useful. So you don't have to spend time doing it. 
And lastly, again, our example, if there's more data that you want to join in, let's say hypothetically we have our tracking data data file here. And if we want to join that data into money into our money puck data set, we can just do that. It only takes one line of code. Um, in this example here, I've you can join on certain fields. So here I'm just matching on name and season and team. And you can also do unions, which is just, you know, where you're kind of stacking data on top of each other um, and all sorts of different types of joins. Much easier to do in R than wrestling with VLOOKUPs in Excel. All right, and lastly, so if you have to make a graph. Again, as I said, it is definitely possible to make um, good looking graphs in Excel, but it's, it is difficult and they're really hard to reproduce. And the good thing about R is R makes it very easy to create really custom looking graphs that are very reproducible. Like this code took me about two seconds to write because I wrote it once a long time ago and I know that this is what I want a standard bar chart to look like. So all I had to do was pull this back out and you know make a few adjustments and then you have a nice chart that took no time at all. It's very reproducible. And again, this is our average shift length, the month average shift length for forwards. And something like this, super easy to make and more importantly, reproduce in R. An exact same thing for the most shifts per game. All right, so just to talk a little bit more about kind of the benefits that come with learning R is great for all of those reasons I just mentioned to kind of make your analysis easier, but it also opens up your kind of entire analysis workflow and introduces you kind of naturally to some other things that just make it much easier to do your work. And again, these examples are R specific, but other languages have their own, certainly have their own variations of all of these things. So first working with GitHub. Um, please do not let the word GitHub just completely scare you and make you shut down like it did for me for literally years. Um, GitHub is possible to learn. I'm still a total beginner, but thanks to R, um, GitHub integrates really easily with R Studio, which is the development environment for R. And thanks to that, I now can put some things on GitHub and it is much easier in order to like save and collaborate and share your work. Um, also specific to R is R Markdown, which makes it incredibly easy to kind of create and share all sorts of content for your work, like creating reports. Um, you can, it works with HTML and LaTeX and you can really um, export like all of your R code really easily, including slides. I made these slides in R. These, all these slides are just built off of R code, like the code and the graphs that you saw earlier in the slides, like those aren't, they're not screenshots. It's just R code that is executable within these slides. So again, all sorts of things you can do. I mentioned again, it's really easy to just make tables. This is a really nice HTML table that is very easy to make from the code that we ran earlier. So there's lots of options within R Markdown. And lastly, um, you can even make websites in R. If you are a nerdy hockey person, you're probably familiar with Evolving Hockey. Evolving Hockey is built in R using Shiny, which is a package that makes it possible to do these um, interactive web development stuff. And there's also a package called Blogdown. My personal website is also built entirely in R um, using that package. So coding makes it easier, obviously, to do the analysis and all the examples that I just talked about, but it also really opens you up to a lot of things that can help your workflow. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you that learning some language might be uh, useful, but how do you actually go about doing that? The first thing that I think is really important, especially if you use Excel heavily, is being able to conceptually move past Excel. Because the reason I think a lot of people like Excel is it is really comforting to be able to see all of your data. Excel makes it feel like you can really get your arms around all of your data and see it, which feels comforting, but it's actually not that necessary. And it's really much more efficient to only look at the pieces of data that you actually need for the questions that you're answering. And Excel, I don't know about like whatever systems that you all have set up, but if I'm working with NHL play-by-play -play data, which you can really easily be getting into millions of rows, like my little MacBook Air does not like, like Excel does not like looking at that much data. And I can't see all of it because it's a million rows and it's impossible. And 
that time it is it's time to move on to something else that can handle that type that type of volume and it's much easier to just keep track of all your different versions of files all your data frames in an r file rather than dealing with tons of workbooks and worksheets because even with our really simple example before with money puck um i might if i were answering those two independent questions i might not want to answer them on the same sheet because that would get confusing so then i would have two sheets that would be identical and that just it gets confusing because the main thing i think that people need to get in terms of this conceptual idea is being able to separate your data from your analysis because in excel you're doing your work in the data file which sounds obvious but really in r it makes it much easier because you're keeping your data file separate like that data file the excel file or your csv file still exists raw and plain and you just bring it in and then you're able to do work on that file so that makes it especially when you're working with big data just is much easier to keep your work organized when all of the analysis and the work is separate from the raw data. All right, um, almost done, promise. I'm trying to be good on time here, watching time. Um, my, once people have kind of moved on conceptually, the reason, the way that I like to help people learn how to use, again, any new language is you really have to treat it like it is learning a new language because all it is, is you know what you want to do. Like in our example, we want to create a new variable and you know how to do that in Excel. And all you have to do is learn what the verbs are in R and learn what kind of the grammar is and the punctuation, right? Like you know how to do an if statement in Excel. And it's really not conceptually any different doing that in R. You just have to learn what, you just have to learn what the different grammar is. Like here, like again, sorting in Excel is just called arrange in R. And it's just learning the different syntax. And like we mentioned, making a pivot table in Excel is the exact same as in R using the combination of the group by and the summarize functions. And sometimes you get really lucky, like with filter, where the language is the same. Like those great words. Um, so my last kind of tips for learning on this is just like you would with a language is you really have to practice a little bit frequently like i don't know if any of you have used the duolingo app for use it for learning different languages but you have like the damn owl that reminds you every single day to do your duo like that's what i think people really need for coding if it's not every day you need to practice a little bit frequently because and it's hard because when you open r and you're a beginner you have to look up how to do everything you have to look up all the translations for all of the verbs and that's hard but every time you do it, you have to look up a little bit less. Like I still very vividly remember the first time that I opened R and I had a question and I was able to answer it. It was, it was only maybe like 10 lines of code, but I was able to do the entire thing without looking anything up. And that is a huge milestone in terms of learning any language. Whether you're talking like a you know normal language or a programming language. Not to say I don't look things up because I look things up every day, but you really just have to practice a little bit every single day to kind of get that basic fluency because then it's just much easier to keep adding things on top of that. And next, I think a lot of people get stuck because it feels like a productive exercise to just look around resource after resource and bookmark like this tutorial and this book that looks really useful, but that's not actually like doing productive work to learn the language. So I really think it really helps to pick one resource and actually go all the way through because there is no perfect resource out there a lot of them are basically the same so you just got to pick one and this sounds silly but it's actually a really important skill when you're learning to code is getting really good at googling i get lots of emails and lots of messages from people who have questions who are learning how to code and i love everyone who emails me or i love all the people who email me nice things and but honestly, about half of the time, the questions I want to respond and just be like, you can Google this. I know you can. Um, you just have to be comfortable with Googling. Like you're going to get error messages in R and that's fine. And you just got to, you just got to figure out how to Google. You got to figure out how to search Stack Overflow and be careful before you ask a question though. Those people can be a little intense, but you got to be able to search on Stack Overflow, learn whatever communities are available for the language that you're learning and become good at Googling because one of the beauties of being like a beginner, even an intermediate user of whatever language is that if you have a problem or something that doesn't work, 
I promise someone else has had that problem, which is actually really comforting because it means the answer is out there on the internet. And lastly, perhaps most of all, is it is so much easier if you have a project in, or a question in mind in order to use as motivation. And this is what I say whenever somebody asks me, how do I get into hockey analytics? Is I say, you have to start with, with something that you want the answer to. And I can say that because that's, that's how I got into hockey analytics is I got really interested in um, goalie pulling is when teams pull the goalie. And there wasn't a lot of data out there on that topic when I started looking into it. And so I decided that I was going to do it. And started working in Excel, quickly, you know, kind of got to the bounds of what you can do officially in Excel and taught myself R in order to answer that question. And it was much easier to kind of overcome those roadblocks and learn what I needed to learn because I had an end goal. So I would really, I would really recommend finding some kind of question or even again, another piece of advice that I give people, especially if you're learning to work with play-by-play data in whatever sport, like hockey or basketball or whatever, is just try to learn how to recreate like box scores. Like in hockey, try to figure out how you write the code to figure out what how many shots on goal each player had and what the goalie save percentage was. Um, basic questions like that can really teach you a lot of the coding language that you need to know. All right, so I told you, we're at the end here. So I told you that you really got to pick one resource and go all the way through. So just to list my three recommendations, um, first is an online book called R for data science, which I can highly recommend because it's basically what I used to teach myself R super useful. It focuses on the tidyverse, which is a collection of packages um, that kind of use a similar language and really provide all you really need to know to be a beginner intermediate data user. Um, and that's how I recommend anyone get into R is by starting on the tidyverse. There was also a really great workshop at this year's R conference called R for Excel users that I think would be really useful for a lot of people in this audience probably. And I mean, I have some R tutorials. I got to plug my own stuff. Um, I have an intro to R that's on hockey graphs, um, also on GitHub with lots of exercises there. And I have a similar intro um, that uses Swirl, which basically a package that allows you to do like interactive learning in the console. So the links are here, I'll post these slides. But again, really recommend picking one resource, hopefully one of these, and just starting on it. Um, lastly, where to find me? Um, I'm on Twitter, post a lot there about hockey and our stuff. I'm also on GitHub, and these slides will be on GitHub. And so if you're curious to see what the R code for slides looks like, you can check them out there. And then my website is also linked here that has links to all of my various tutorials. So please um, go forth and code and don't, um, don't know if we're going to have, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions, but um, my email is out there and feel free to reach out to me on any of those platforms. I can personally vouch for Megan's tutorials. They're tremendous resources, fantastic to use. So oh, thank you. Check those out. Megan, we have um, questions for you. Lots of good questions. Okay. Um, first, it's probably pretty easy. You, you referenced Money Puck, obviously. Are there other good resources to find hockey data to use? Yes, so um, Money Puck is really great. Um, Natural Stat Trick also um, has, they have some individual game data and a lot of summary data. And also, um, I mentioned Evolving Hockey, they also have a lot of data. Some of their data is behind a paywall via Patreon, but I can say as a longtime Patreon supporter, um, is well worth it. But those are kind of really my three top resources for data. Awesome. Um, Mike wanted to know, and you might have to go into the background of this, maybe for people who aren't familiar with R, but could you clarify what packages you were using in addition to base R? Yeah, that's a great question. So I do um, the vast majority of my work through the Tidyverse. Um, the Tidyverse, as I mentioned, is a collection of packages that includes um, ggplot, which is what most people use for data visualization, um, uses Tidier, which is what most people use for like data manipulation stuff. So I think the Tidyverse really takes you um, most of where you need to go. And like, to be honest, I, I think it's a much more, I think it's a much more gentle introduction to R. I mean, even now, like, I don't know that much base R, honestly. Um, like I'm trying to be better and learn more, but like, I don't, I don't really work in base R very often. I work in mostly in the tidyverse and then, you know, other packages that like come along that I need to learn for various purposes. Here's a good one for you. Have you found any limitations with R in the same way that you eventually felt limited by Excel, things oh. it doesn't do well. 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say me personally, no, but I would, I mean, I still really consider myself a, I'm trying to call myself an intermediate user of R and not a beginner user anymore. Um, but I wouldn't call myself an advanced user. So there certainly are, um, there certainly are limitations. Um, especially I think if you're moving away from kind of data sciencey things, but R has, has, um, all the functions that I need. And this is, uh, we'll maybe finish with this one, but this is a really good one since you're so skilled in both. Um, when should one use R and when should one use Tableau? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. Yes. Cause I do use, um, I use Tableau a lot. So I think it is easier if you're, if you're looking for data visualizations that you want to share with a lot of people, I think it is easier to get started in Tableau and share them in Tableau. You can certainly, um, you can certainly do that in R, like with Shiny, like I mentioned, the entire Evolving Hockey website is built on Shiny. Shiny is really powerful in terms of making like interactive web dashboards, but I think the learning curve is steeper. Um, and so I think if you're a beginner, you know, Tableau is good for that. Like when I have things that I want to share, like big dashboards that I want to share with a lot of people, I use Tableau. If I want to make individual, just like an individual chart, then it depends. I probably use R because I'm probably already using R to do that kind of analysis. Um, so it just depends.